have a range of hills. We then have a range of hills called the Pennines, which run down the centre of northern England. And Colin is near Manchester on the other side of the Pennines, the western side. Uh, he lives in a, a little town called Rochdale. So uh, we're about 40 miles or so apart. So uh, he's doing the driving. I'm doing the presenting. And the way it works is we'll run through the presentation. Please don't use the chat function while the presentation is running because it puts a black box across the screen. Uh, uh, but you can use it at the end and we'll give you a chance for questions at the end. So as I say, welcome um, uh, one and all. Ready when you are, Carl. Okay. Right. Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to uh, our presentation on Cornwall's fabulous geology, which is running for eight nights from May 8 to 16. That means it starts on the evening of May the 8th in time for the evening meal and finishes after breakfast on the 16th. Uh, more about the uh, travel arrangements and things later on. OK, next. OK, so uh, first glance, the geology of Cornwall and Cornwall is the England's most southerly and westerly uh, county um, is relatively simple. Um, there is this strange little area called Lizard and Start Complex, which is right down at the south there. Um, it's just above the scale bar is the Lizard. Um, then uh, it turns out that that too is Devonian. And then the uh, sedimentary rocks, which are mildly metamorphosed uh, to slate grade, um, are Devonian and Carboniferous. The Permian, Triassic, Jurassic, Cretaceous and Tertiary are all outside of Cornwall, over to the east there, they're actually in Devon. So on the face of it, it's Devonian and Carboniferous, mildly metamorphosed sediments, along with a number of granites. But the moment we start to look at it in a little bit greater detail, it starts to unravel. So we go to the next one, Cole. So let's just show you some pictures to start with. Well, I think Lizard is a special place because um, everything you need is there. It's uh, great in the winter as well as the summer. But of course, uh, Lizard sticks out into the ocean and it's almost an island, so it's a lot of fishing all the way from uh, Helford River right around to uh, Port Levin. Um, good fresh fish, crab, lobster, um, spider crab. Once you've been here, you'll, you'll come back again. People just keep coming back probably for a few days in the winter as well as the summer, and they just get to know people, really. That's, that's a nice bit about it. Well, we're sitting here on the southernmost point of the UK, Lizard Point, and uh, it's a very special place. I'm very lucky to earn some of my living traveling to far distant global destinations, but uh, this is the place I come to when I come home. One of the great things about the Lizard is the astonishing contrast that you find. If you walk round from the east, um, from the Helford River, it's very sheltered from uh, the, the maritime storms and you have very lush, folded valleys. As you move round to the west of the Lizard, around Lizard Point, you get a much more dramatic seascape. Spikes of rock striking up through the sea, much heavier surf. It's uh, a, a strong maritime climate. Oh, the Lizard, absolutely unique place in the world. 
there's probably about three places where the Earth's inner crust comes to the surface, and this is one of them, which makes it pretty special. And you can see that with the serpentine rock that we get around here. Um, and that makes it amazing for biodiversity as a whole. So we get unusual biology that comes around here, unusual geography, geology, um, all sorts of things, which makes it a perfect place to come and explore. We're just really lucky down here. We've got an amazing community, and hopefully we're giving more people the opportunity to see things they wouldn't normally see. So that smashed one um, uh, idea you may have had already. Yes, it's Devonian, but it's a Devonian ophiolite down there on the Lizard Peninsula. We've got peridotite now altered to serpentine. We've got gabbros. We've got uh, diabase. We got pillow lavas all upended. So oceanic seafloor down on the Lizard Peninsula. Next one, Colm. So let's start to look at it in a little bit greater detail. Not so simple after all. We've got an awful lot of alochthonous material. The middle part of this map is alochthonous material. In other words, if you're not familiar with that word, uh, that means this is tectonically emplaced. It means, put simply, it's been thrust. We've got major thrusts moving stuff a long way north. Please ignore these days around the side. They come from wherever this map actually originates. Nothing to do with us. But immediately, you've got a lot more tectonics going on. And I have to say to you, those of you looking forward to going to Scotland in a couple of weeks' time, the truth is that the geology of southwest England, and in particular Cornwall, is every bit as complicated as the geology of Northwest Scotland. It just happens to be somewhat younger in age. Um, the uh, uh, orogeny that produced it is very much later than things happening in uh, Northwest Scotland. But it's actually every bit as complicated. We've got some pretty incompetent rocks, which then means we get an awful lot of thrusts Look here, you've got melange and schists marked on there. So this melange effectively is a, is a plate margin uh, recorded for us. So really, really interesting. Um, and I have to say to you, we don't fully understand it even now. The big difference geologically between this and Northwest Scotland is if this is uh, an erosion surface. It's much higher in the crust than the ones in northwest Scotland, where the rocks are so much more ancient. Okay, next one, come. These magnificent Cornish moorlands are host to a deep and rich geological history. And that history goes back hundreds of millions of years. But it's also influenced the present industrial heritage of Britain. And that geology is no better represented than by these massive granite tours that litter here and all around the moorland areas around us. A tour is an eroded remnant of a granite intrusion formed by weathering processes over millions of years. The classic building block shape of these granite tours is all down to the structure inside. All the big joints and cracks is the way it weathers. But it's the granites that I've come here to see. We're going to go and hunt around now, find some fresh surfaces and find out just exactly how this forms. Granite is an igneous rock formed by melting processes in the Earth's crust. It can be formed in a number of ways, but is commonly associated with mountain building events, when the Earth's tectonic plates collide with great force. 
This causes the crust to thicken and melting occurs. Before these granites were solid rock, they're actually molten magma, which was slowly moving its way up through the much colder surrounding rocks. As it moved up, it slowly crystallized and grew very, very large crystals. Oh, look at this face. When we get close up to the granites, it's very easy to see the characteristic minerals that they possess. That's because they're so large. Look at this giant felspar here. That probably started growing first in the magma. All around it, you see lots of these sort of see-through gray minerals. That's quartz, the same thing that you get in the glass of your house. And on close inspection, there's lots of shiny faces. Silver-like ones, that's muscovite mica, a certain type of mica in the rock. And then there's these rusty brown ones, that's biotite mica. Now these contain lots and lots of metals within them. If we can find a geological process that gets those metals out and concentrates them, we could be into something that's economically viable. What's even more fantastic is you can look at these rocks in glorious detail under a microscope. And in the modern era, we can actually do that on a virtual microscope, which I'm using here. You can use this on a tablet, on a smartphone, on the web, anywhere you can get access to get right down and look at the minerals. It's a beautiful mica there in fantastic, glorious colour. These rocks here are quite fresh and solid, but that's not always the case, as we'll see when we look at some of the other granites around Cornwall. This gigantic hole in the ground is Will Martin China Clay Pit. Now they've been mining clays like this in Cornwall for over 200 years and it has many, many uses, most famous of which is for porcelain, which is exported all over the world. But what many of you may not realise is that this clay was once granite. So how do you go from a solid granite like this to clays like this. When the granites are in place, they have hot fluids associated with them. These fluids reach out into the surrounding rocks, but also start the early stages of alteration of the minerals within the granite itself. When a magma comes in and solidifies to a granite, it actually takes a long time to cool. And that's because it contains its own heat engine locked up in the minerals are radioactive elements that give off heat. Because of those radioactive elements, the granites stay far hotter than the surrounding rocks for a long, long period of time after they've solidified, many millions of years. And it's that heat from the hot granites at depth that cook up the groundwater in the surrounding rocks. They start to generate massive hydrothermal circulation bringing in quite aggressive corrosive fluids into every nook and cranny within the granite. They start to leach out key elements, altering the crystals and ultimately changing something which is a solid rock to a massive clay pit. But transforming granites, solid granites like this, to clay takes millions and millions of years but it's the first fluids that come in with the molten magma that carry that extra special ingredient. Whenever we find granites in contact with the rocks around them, it's never a simple contact. The hot magmas that come in are laced with fluids and these fluids shoot out into the surrounding geology and cause mineralized layers like we see on this outcrop here. The thing that's important about these mineral veins, you can see some light and dark ones shooting through this boulder here, is that these are filled with many elements, some of which are precious. Now these veins here are actually quite small and the crystals inside are quite difficult to see. 
but in many instances the veins are really big and the crystal's quite large. Now, I've been given some samples by the Will Martin China Clay Museum here to show you some of those. Now, there, this one here is some beautiful tourmaline crystals with some quartz in the background, really quite pretty. Tourmaline's a little bit like a bucket mineral. It can take a whole range of different elements, but it's concentrated in boron. We see some beautiful colour minerals, like this one, turquoise here. You also get malachites and other minerals rich in copper. That can be quite important. But this one, ooh, it's quite heavy actually. It doesn't look like much, but this is made of a mineral known as cassiterite. And that's what Cornwall's famous for, because this contains tin. Okay, so that uh, opened a few doors for you and made you realise that we don't just have granite, we have alteration products of granite, and we, of course, have the hydrothermal metallic ores of tin, copper, lead, and zinc. Next one, Carl. So, final one in the, um, the map series, as it were. This comes from ResearchGate, <clears throat> and it's pretty recent and uh, really gives you some of the ideas of um, of the uh, Hercinian orogeny, which is around the end of the Carboniferous. Um, and you may know it as the Hercinian, but, uh, or you may know it as the Variscan. Um, but uh, it's a continental collision. And in that collision, the Rheic Ocean was destroyed. And that's the origin of this lizard complex. So uh, this is an ongoing story. We are moving forward. If you want to know where we are based as it, uh, um, on this map, um, we are approximately uh, just inland uh, from the line, which you can see there, uh, separating the Lou Basin and the Gram Scatho Basin. So we're sort of a quarter of an inch in from the north coast, uh, about where Collins now put the arrow. That's where we're going to be based. So we can access north, south, east and west. Next one, Col. So where are we staying? Well, the first thing to say is you would think it would be easy to find hotels in an area which is um, a holiday area. The truth is you can at a price. Um, they, they, they market themselves very much towards the uh, summer family business um, and you get a lot of exclusive hotels and they're always down little narrow lanes in little beautiful coastal localities uh, where you can't get a coach, where you can't house a group. We managed to find this place. Um, it's uh, um, a fairly basic in the sense that it is clean, comfortable accommodation. Uh, we have it exclusively for ourselves. Um, it's run as a local business. It has been successfully run for several years, uh, and it's a very much a family affair. The person we dealt with on the phone turned out to be uh, the owner's mother, um, and uh, he turns out to be an ex-teacher, uh, very into uh, his customer service. I've been down there and stayed for three nights. I've chatted to the owner, and I know he understands what I'm looking for, what I need, and there was nothing that was too much trouble. The highlight of the place is it is superb food. They have a very good reputation with local people. I was there in February, totally out of the tourist season. We couldn't eat in their restaurant one night, even though it seats 100 people because it was fully booked. You can't get a better reputation than that. It is good, honest, uh, genuine food, 
And uh, when he says he can do something, I'm sure he'll do it for us. We have a private room where we'll have our meals together for each night. And uh, he's already talking uh, quite good things about menus and everything else. Rooms are all clean, uh, all on the one level. There are no stairs. It's a, a one level uh, building uh, and uh, there is a lounge area. Rooms have TVs, uh, Wi-Fi, etc. But as I say, it's not luxury, but it is clean. It is very good. And most of all, it's ours. We're not sharing with anybody else, which is great. Next one, Col. So the interesting thing about the site is it's a five acre site. There's, there's places we can sit outside, places you can wander around. Um, there's lots um, of space. It's a former tin mining site. And where it says welcome to Trickies, that's the restaurant area, which is separate to the residential area we have our breakfast in our residential patch but these are the the restaurant buildings the buildings look old don't they 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 are the restaurant is housed the whole site is a former tin mine um, called tolgus mount and the buildings where the restaurant are are the the blacksmiths the mine workshop, the engineers, where they would have sharpened the tools for mining, etc. And uh, down the bottom there, those stacks uh, are uh, um, uh, mine shaft stacks there for engines, steam engines. So this is all part of the um, the uh, heritage, if you like, of the area. We're actually about a mile, a mile and a quarter from the town of Red Roof itself. Um, so uh, taxi ride away. Um, there are no buses out to here, um, but taxis uh, less than £10 to come out. OK, our bus will come and pick us up. Next one. So talking of transport, uh, we've got a choice of two local companies. Um, who can provide us with uh, a bus to suit the size of the group. I don't want a really big bus. If we have a really big bus, we can't get it down little roads. So I'm looking for a transport that's of the right size. I'm hoping I can also get you on one of our little quaint trains down here. Uh, this is the St. Ives branch, um, and it's about a 15-minute train journey Trust me, you wouldn't even think of taking the coach into St. Ives. Uh, the roads are jammed even when we're there um, in this uh, relatively early part of the season. But the little train will drop us just fine. Next one, Cole. So the mining area, it's World Heritage. Um, it's UNESCO World Heritage. What's... World Heritage about it? Well, it's these amazing Cornish engines. So these are the beam engines that date from the late 18th and early, very early 19th century. And they were dealing with the number one problem in the mines. And that was dewatering these deep mines. The mines go under the Atlantic Ocean. And there is the Atlantic Ocean there on the north coast. This is a uh, Batalic mine. Um, and so that beam engine would be going up and down inside those tall engine, uh, those tall buildings, um, bringing up, pumping up water. So world heritage. Um, and uh, so you're coming to an area which is definitely five star. Next one, Cole. Little bit more of the um, lizard ophiolite, which uh, you've already had vaguely introduced to you. Um, the top of the pile of rocks is towards the Porthallo end. Okay, um, the lizard boundary fault is there, uh, and but you can see um, that there are um, effectively 
basalts, that's the spillite there. There's some nice kenaknices, there's the sheeted dike complex, there's gabbros, there's peridotites, all of which are effectively turned into uh, serpentine right now. This is a wonderful area. We will get right down to the lizard point. Uh, it's a decent road all the way down there. Um, so we will be going there. You will be able to see uh, serpentines. Sometimes, fair to say, we'll have a short walk because the coach won't be able to, of any size coach, won't be able to get us exactly where we want to be. But I can tell you there are bus services to Coverack. There are bus services to Mullion. So if a service bus can get there, so can we. Next one, Cole. Here's the serpentines. Should be beautiful um, florally you know, every, when you're every there. Seven, it's Perfect like, time of year. That's the most southerly point of the UK.
Excellent. Next one, Cole. So, Lizard Rocks then. Well, as you've seen already, banded nicers, uh, peridotites, basic dikes cutting through, basically everything that you would expect um, in an Ophiolite complex. Um, not all of it terribly visible, but it would rate as our best Ophiolite. Um, but particularly want to get you down to somewhere like Kainam's Cove so you can inv investigate the serpentines for, yourself, for yourselves. I also know a place inland that we can visit where you can collect specimens. Collecting of specimens and hammering is not allowed at many UK sites, particularly those owned by the National Trust. So I need to find you somewhere else if you're wanting to collect or hammer. Next one, Cole. This rock has got big sounding chrysolites on it, chrysotile, and one, when you move your finger in one direction it's quite smooth, but when you move it in the other direction it's quite um, rough. Um, this is because of the orientation of the fibres. Um, this shows the direction of a shearing fault, and once the stress um, keeps going in one direction, the fibres tend to follow the other direction as well. Okay, this is another example of bastite serpentinite at Kynance Cove. Um, in this one, you can see the bastites are uh, roughly sort of um, hexagonal shaped minerals. Um, in this example, they've been sheared, so they're producing a foliation running in that direction. Is it smooth? It's smooth in one direction and then it's uh -huh. rough in the other, which means that it formed in a, in a fault and the crystals okay. grew in the direction of the fault. So the mm -hmm. smooth direction is the direction of the fault. Mm -hmm. so, okay. It's fibrous. Yeah, it's fibrous. I thought like it's open feel. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. so open feel. Mm -hmm. And it's also made of asbestos. Yeah, it's an asbestos mineral. That's right, Micah. So, what kind of a rock would you call that? No, no, no. A granite? What's the grain size? It's fine grained, so either you could call it an aplite or a micro granite. Okay, so this is uh, bastite serpentinite. Uh, these vitreous bits, but it's more pearly, the uh, luster, they're the bastites. Um, and then you can also see differential weathering in the sample, so it's sort of around here. So, what minerals can you see in this rock? Uh, well, I can see um, quartz, um, feldspar, um, there's a bit of a pinky one, which could be orthoclase feldspar. Um, there's little black minerals, which could be tourmaline. Why do you think they're tourmaline? Well, if you look through it with a hand lens, the, it's quite needly. It's all the same size, apart from the tourmaline, which is quite visible. It's a bluey, yellowy, green colour. Um, it's not fibrous. Um, and it's got a massive texture, um, and it's antigorite, which is a serpentine mineral. Okay, uh, this piece is serpentinite. Uh, it's got antigorite, which is more apple green. Uh -huh. uh, it's also got um, chrysotile, and it's got a soapy texture, mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's also got this sort of stepped texture. Mm -hmm. And by looking at that, you can tell the uh, relative sense of movement of the shearing of the two blocks. White vein feels quite soft. It's not calcite or quartz, it could possibly be magnesite or talc. So if I put some acid on it to see if it effervesces, and it effervesces very nicely, I think that's probably magnesite, which is a magnesium carbonate. It's going to be quite a bit quicker going across this year because there's sands coming. Which came first, the basalt or the gabbro? The basalt. So we've got a basalt dike which is cut by gabbro. The gabbro seems to have been very highly sheared. Is it the serpentine? 
Yeah, it's the best I've been tonight. There's small Gabriel Dykes. The Basel Dyke in Gabriel. What's going on? It's Gabriel. You can see some whitey, yellowy bell spars. Yeah. See some other larger things. There are actually some bastites in there as well. Remember, bastites are altered pyroxenes. Tremble like pen tonight. Very dark, it's very homogeneous. Quite ready to dark brown. And this is supposed to be an altered dummy. That's University College London. I promise we'll do our geology a bit slower than that. Okay, next one, Carl. So, I've indicated the orogenic nature of this Beriscan or Silicinian. Uh, a lot of the structures are fairly flat-lying. This is Tintagel Island, which lies off the north coast of Cornwall. It's connected by that bridge there. Um, this is a historic site. If you look very carefully, uh, you can actually see some very low-lying structures running sort of uh, high up right to sea level left. And in fact, there's a couple of pale beds that repeat and a couple of very dark beds that repeat. They have lovely names. There's the Barris Nose Beds and my favourite, the Trambley Cove Beds. These are thrusts. These are major thrust planes exploiting the fact that uh, former clay rocks, now slight, the metamorphosed to slaty material, will actually be very weak layers when it comes to uh, resisting thrusts. So the thrusts have moved from right to left. And I may, mean plural, there are two thrust slices here. Next one. And this is nearby Boss Castle. Um, that's actually a quartz vein that has itself been folded. Um, there's at least two phases of folding and uh, metamorphism here in a very short space of time. Um, uh, incredible structures, uh, particularly in incompetent beds. In fact, the fold styles here, whether they're chevron or box folds, is directly related to the rock type. So as we go further north in Cornwall, we get to a place called Bude, uh, where there are much more sandstones in the sequence. We end up with much simpler box folds. Down here at Boss Castle, we get really tight chevron folding. Next one, Cole. So let's just look at the granite and the alteration. This is a, a rather... <laughs> The ridiculous place called Roche Rock. And if you know your French, it's effectively calling this Rock Rock. Um, but this is the altered St. Austell granite. This is a, a rock called Quartz Shawl, S-C-H-O-R-L. And it's actually a quartz tourmaline rock um, altered by a process called tourmalinization, which attacks the felspars um, and the micas to a certain extent. Um, with boron bearing solutions. And this is the, the one of the alterations that ends up with kaolinization and the complete destruction, really, of the original granite rock. Next one, Carl. So this, uh, the, the mine sh shaft shown there is South Crofty which is about four miles from where our hotel is. This is closer to Camborne than, uh, than to Red Ruth, but that is now part of a major South Crofty revival. Um, it's being done by a Canadian company, as far as I'm aware, and they're hoping to really start um, mining again within about two years. The story of our mining industry is that everything was fine till about 1980, when tin prices collapsed. The UK government um, didn't intervene 
uh, in the London tin market, um, prices dropped to some ridiculous level, like three and a half thousand pounds a ton. That's about four and a bit thousand dollars a ton. Well, it's now twenty thousand pounds a ton, twenty five thousand dollars a ton. Um, and, uh, you know, what was uneconomic is now highly economic. So the main problem is dewatering. They're in the dewatering process right now, and then they will start mining again. Two, two uh, objects here. One to get at fairly high levels of tin. Anything up to 5% has been recorded, but also to mine lithium from uh, the mine, which has never been worked before. It's present in some uh, uh, porphyries, uh, uh, pegmatite type veins down the mine. It's not been done before. So watch this space. Next one. going to visit Givor. It's a tourist attraction these days, but we'll wander through the ruins of the processing plant and we do go uh, briefly underground. Next one, Carl. Um, we're also going to go to China, the China Clay Museum at Wheel Martin, um, which is uh, where the guy was showing you some of the samples, including his his tin. It's an excellent place to go, gives a really good oversight and it's uh, we get access to see that view that he showed you of the enormous uh, Will Martin China clay pit, which is an active works. OK, next one. Um, there are currently two people having a go at uh, uh, lithium uh, extraction. One is using um, uh, lithium from um, waste material from China clay works, which is about lipidolite mica, which has been stored separately. The other, um, which I think is Cornwall uh, lithium, is actually looking at extracting lithium from dissolved from groundwater, from concentrations dissolved in groundwater. So quite an exciting project. 
Um, I think there's a side um, to some of this as well. There are they are hoping to probably recover some rare earths along the way. I think that's what's driving South Crofty as well. Next one, Cole. So there's Will Martin, the China Clay um, Museum at the top, and there's um, uh, Givor Mine, um, the, the old tin mine down the bottom there. But there is something else if we go to the next one, Cole. Um, this is an amazing site, um, and these are uh, tourmaline veins. This is altered granite down on the shore at, below Cligger Head. Uh, which is itself a mining site less than 20 miles from um, uh, our hotel base. That's one of the beauties of, of Cornwall. A lot of the stuff is close to where we want it. Next one. And this is, believe it or not, the only source of tin today being produced. This is a, a tin stamper where what they do, they take uh, crushed, uh, they take material uh, which is uh, relatively rich in tin. Some of it recovered from uh, Prince William, who happens to be the Duke of Cornwall, uh, from his uh, beaches. This uh, um, family uh, fair, uh, firm have uh, access to Duchy of Cornwall beach material, they they grind it down by using this tin stamper, which just drops these rods on it. And then they use uh, um, concentration methods as old as the hills um, called Whiffley tables to actually get a tin concentrate. And you can actually get little ornaments, things like tin beam engines, little beam engines, um, about two inches high but it's a place that I want to take you to because it is the only active tin workings in Cornwall today next one so a summary then we're offering Devonian and Carboniferous strata complicated in places downright annoying in places. We're offering you carboniferous granite, a Devonian ophiolite, tin mineralization, veriscan orogenic structures, China clay mining, great landscape and scenery with comfortable lodgings and good food. Next one. Where will we be going subject to confirmation? Well, We'll get the Lizard and West Cornwall, the St. Austell Granite, North Cornwall Slates and Structures, Tintagel and Boss Castle, the Wheel Martin China Clay Museum, Tin and Lithium Mining Sites, and the Givor Tin Mine. I may use the fact that you are from uh, the AIPG to try and get you access to one of the Lithium Mining Sites, but I can't promise. Um, a lot of that is down to their security and so on. Next one, Cole. Well, sign up if you haven't already. Pay your deposit. I understand there are no single rooms left, so you would need to act mega quickly, i.e. you can't. Um, so the single rooms have, I understand, gone. There are some family rooms for three stroke four people. Best flight option from the USA is London Heathrow, then train from Reading to Redruth. There is no need to go into central London. Um, you can now get the Elizabeth line from Heathrow to Reading and then direct to Redruth. Takes about five hours. It's a long journey. Um, the, 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 the trains are comfortable. Uh, there should be uh, at least a buffet car. There may on a couple of trains even be a restaurant car. But uh, it, that's the way I would suggest. The nearest airport is Newquay, which is about 10, 15 miles away. Um, but there would be pretty poor transport links um, to Newquay. But do inquire if you don't want to do a five hour train journey, 
do inquire about uh, flights from London uh, to Newquay. But remember, it would need to be London Heathrow. Next one, Cole. Hope you've enjoyed that and we're ready to take questions. Thank you very much. Do bring everybody back, Cole. Thanks so much for that presentation, Chris. Um, right, that can was really I, fun to see. Can I um, um, start off by offering uh, Kathy and uh, um, um, Wendy Dawn the opportunity, if you want to say anything, because I don't want to say anything that <laughs> cuts across anything you're saying. So anything from Kathy or Dawn, first of all. I'll raise my hand. I would just say that, you know, we're very excited about Scotland. I've been with you before on your trips. You do a great job, you and Colin both. Um, very enjoyable. It is a vacation as well as a, a Mecca area for a geologist. So people should not feel as though there's too much, uh, you know, physical activity or anything like that. It You know, the, it's a very flexible low-key sort of uh, geology experience. Thank Even non-geologists enjoy it. Absolutely, so yeah. Bring um, family members or friends who are not geologists. Who knows? We might even find a cultural experience. Who knows? Mm. <laughs> Anything from you, Kathy? Oh, right. No, I think Don covered it. Um, we're just here to help everyone get registered and answer as many questions as we can. Right, Carl, if I can ask you to pick out the people, if you raise a hand, and I'll, Colin will do the, the directing. It's uh, John and Sarah. Okay, John and Sarah. Yes, thank you very much. This is Sarah, this is John. Um, wonderful presentation, I'm looking forward to it. I've always wanted to go to Tintagel, I'm an old Arthurian file <laughs> um one of the questions and to see the statue of the guy who's halfway there we'll tell them more about it but the, one of the questions i have i've been le learning about this etias document kind of an online thing that they're going to some of the schengen countries are going to be having in 2025 and i know the uk is not schengen but do you have any clue whether a document like that is going to be needed? E it, certainly, it certainly isn't at the moment. Uh, I've not heard anybody say anything, and we get quite a few Americans for various thing, uh, you know, trips at the moment, you know, we, where they don't come as part of a group and they just join us. And nobody's mentioned anything, uh, but I can... Uh, uh, but I would suggest to you that you uh, contact uh, your governmental people uh they'd be probably the people to know right well you don't have to worry about that i guess since you're yeah. but as i say there. we haven't genuinely you're the first that's the first time i've heard even of the prospect of anything but nothing seems to happen in government very quickly so i think you'll be all right okay thank you so much it's a pleasure i look forward to seeing you in scotland <laughs> absolutely okay bye bye oh actually i got just one more question i should yep. save it for the people but i have a pair of little hiking boots that are somewhat broken in uh would it be okay to wear um just regular shoes that are that are very sturdy at least and not covering the ankle i wouldn't advise it I would advise covering the ankle. Yeah, I really would. Uh, I don't want to be in a position of you uh, uh, having a nasty accident. Uh, it's not that we're pushing it, but I really would think the ankle is the key bit to support. What, don't you agree, Carl? Uh, certainly. And uh, also, if, if you bust any other part of the body, it's fine. But if you bust your ankle, that's you for the rest of your life. So, yeah, support the ankle. 
Yes, been there, done that. Thank you. <laughs> it's a pleasure. Okay, pick somebody else, Carl. Hmm. Anybody else? No one else has got. Oh, no one else has got their hands up at the moment. Anybody else want to ask a question? Have you looked at chat, Cole? You've got some in the chat box. There's a comment from Dawn there about global entry. It's very convenient to get an advance of travel. But when we're any specific questions, we've got a guy from Turkey here as well. Okay. At least I think it's a guy, can't tell. And the name no no one is jumping up and down chris okay well in that case uh if you do subsequently have any queries route them via you dawn yes route sure. them by, or, or, or if you've got our uh, direct do contact us but in the meantime get signed up yes he I look probably forward. already sold us on the trip, so no questions. <laughs> we look forward to seeing you, don't we, Cole? We certainly do. And some of you in two weeks' time, less than two weeks' time. Okay, take care. Thank, Thank you, you so very much. much. Good night. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye.